might have a small like feeling from somewhere small but just from my notes because I don't know how dark it will get when you disappear. Do you have do you have a small like a little picture of how dark it could get when the way BB read my just my notes? Yeah. <laughs> You're hostile then, right? <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try and start uh, precisely uh, uh, at 6.30 so that if anybody has a dance recital or something at 7, you can still make it. Um, I'm going to give you sort of a brief history of Hop Hop uh, tonight. Uh, I thought there'd be three people here, a little more than three. Um, but I, I'm going to do it with some slides, if that's okay, rather than just making it a, a sort of a dry lecture. Uh, if there's some point in the presentation that you want more material on, I'll attempt to do that. Um, but I'm just going to try and make this as interesting as possible without making it like a doctoral dissertation. Um, uh, I lived in Smithtown, but taught in uh, Hop Hog High School for 35 years. Uh, from yes, I know. Uh, from uh, 19 <laughs> from 1969 to uh, uh, 05. Uh, and I taught a course in Long Island history, uh, which the district let me introduce in 1973, uh, which I thought was sort of amazing. But I, um, at that particular time, I was reading the 1970 census, which I'm sure most of you have read by now. Um, and it said that more than 70% of this nation was born and died within a 100 mile radius of where they were born. And I said, no, no, we're not. We're all going to Florida. And so we're not, you know, and then I realized I was born Jamaica, Queens, grew up in Hicksville, was now living in Smith, and I had moved 35 miles, and I was declining enrollment, I was going to die here. And I knew very little about Long Island history, uh, and let alone uh, our area. Um, and I realized that from teaching school, I'd ask, who was William Floyd, and you would get something, well, he built the parkway. Because if, and you didn't laugh, which bothers me immensely. Um, if Robert Moses built the causeway, William Floyd built the parkway. Not that he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. California has no signers. Florida has no signers. So we had, and kids didn't know about where they were. Um, so I figured, why not teach a little bit about Long Island history? And in the process, talk about uh, Hop Hop, because that's where they were. Lincoln always said that uh, a man should be proud of the place in which he lives. If he did today, he'd say win in Boston. But in that process, I thought that that was part of this routine of learning. So um, this is part of that lecture, an attempt not to bore you to death with it. Um, if you, again, have any questions as you sort of go through, um, you can ask them. Yeah, sure. Uh, the Land of Sweetwaters is uh, an Aleni Lenape. Um, it's from language of Algonquin Indians that lived here um, in a Hapag area. And this was a place that they actually came for the winter. They went really on the sound for the summertime and the, went to the South Shore. But in the wintertime, Hapag was fairly well protected, so they came here. And there were little pockets of water all around the place, like good, sweet, <laughs> forest, brook. <laughs> Are you going to make me do this? <laughs> There's a lot of names. Hidden Pond. Good. I like I like community involvement. There's a whole load of names that involve itself with that. Um, there was Stinford's Pond that was right near the entranceway to the state buildings. There was a whole load of them that were kicking around in this area. And there was Brook Lane. All this, all the material that you'll find, there were little pockets. Of, and they loved the fact that this fresh water that was here. So that was neat. And it's either fresh water uh, um, excuse me, sweet water or overflowed land is the other translation. Um, short story, um, 
how many game points here or not. Uh, they were building the um, uh, athletic field uh, at high school quite a few years ago now. Uh, and they were looking for a name for the stadium. So I said, this is a great idea. I'll drag all my failing students over to the board meeting and we'll get the stadium named Sweetwater Stadium. I said, we're going to lock into our heritage of Sweetwater Stadium. So that night appeared and I had a few of the board members know that I was coming. So we went over there and I thought this was a great attempt to get these young people to understand uh, Hop Hog and its essence and its Native American language and Lenny Lenape was going to reemerge. So I suggested to the board Sweetwater Stadium. And it was this great pause. And they said, no. I said, we're not going to have a football team playing in Sweetwater Stadium. <laughs> And I said, well, that, again, the history is important. We should lock on to that history that we have. And I said, that would be, people would ask, why is it Sweetwater Stadium? And we could say, well, that's what Hop Hog means uh, because we have so many Indian names on the island, you know, Ronkonkoma, Kopeg, Shinnecock, okay? Head of the Harbor, no, okay? Head of, um, that's where you laugh, Head of the Harbor is not included. Uh, so we got to the uh, point of Sweetwater, Sta Sweetwater Stadium and they said no. Uh, and they went on to the thing and they finally decided, one of the members said, um, we're going to go with uh, the eagle's nest, where the eagles, you know, actually would nest. Uh, and I said, I, I waited and waited and waited and waited. And then they were going to get down to the final. And I raised my hand and I said, you know, I know history is not all that important at this stage of the game. And I know that's why the freshwater Hop on sweet water is not going to make it, but it is what I tell you before you do this that the Eagle's Nest was their summer home in Bavaria. Well, that board never really forget that I let them bait all the way to the very end. <laughs> so it, it just became Eagle Stadium, but that I thought I made it. Um, I guess there some postcards in the very, very beginning. I used postcards with uh, young people to sort of give them a little sense of where they were. Uh, and this fella ain't got nothing going if he doesn't have a car. Uh, and auto. Um, hello, hello, here I am in Hop Hog. Yes, come at once. It's a dandy town. This is, uh, again, from a time period we don't do postcards anymore. We get on our cell phone uh, and even send pictures that way, but we've passed the postcard period. Uh, this is, we are having such a good time in a scene near Hop Hog, New York. Now, the funny thing about collecting postcards from Hop Hog is you have to go someplace else. Uh, I've been most of hot dog postcards are in Massachusetts or in Connecticut or something like that because they're just no one sending them to their next door neighbor at this stage of the game. Can I change? Come on. Oh, my dish guess is if you're looking for that, I think this is Lake Ronkonkoma because it says seen near hot dog. And so I think they're getting away with it there. Uh, uh, that's a little wide for the Nesquad River. And you want to connect with me there? It might be my, is it going to work? OK. Uh, and this was actually a, a painting I found, uh, which said Hop Hog on the back of it, um, and it listed as Hop Hog, but it was this little watercolor painting that I just sort of threw into the postcards. Uh, good. Know where this is? Exactly right. That's what students said to me. I said, where do you find this hill in Hop Hog? And they said, oh, that's the dump. No, this is a false postcard. This is a, this is, there's no, there's no, you, coming off the expressway and coming up there. Look, you can see Northport from here. No, there's nothing like that. But I will tell you that I interviewed a woman who used to do postcards in Germany. Uh, and that's where we got most of our postcards from. And I said, how come I'm looking at this postcard of Hopog? I said, what did you do? She said, well, sometimes she's in Lindenhurst. Did I mention that to you? She's in Lindenhurst telling me she came from Germany to this place that she actually saw in postcards that she was actually painting. And she said, a lot of times I would get like 25 cents for doing 100 postcards, I would paint the postcards. And at 100 postcards, you get, I don't know where Hopog is. So sometimes I would put in a cloud, I put in a mountain. <laughs> so she would just redo the postcard she was doing because she was bored doing 100 postcards uh, of Hopa in that regard. Just a dump. See, it's no, no, we're looking like that. Just forget it. 
when I had actually no time when it was a snow day, a lot of times I went flying to take Hapag from the air. Uh, and this is typical of postcards that you get from Hapag. This is to Miss William Oliveri. Uh, no street address, just Hapag. Uh, whoops. I'm so embarrassed. I shouldn't do that. This new technology bothers me. Uh, but these, these, um, this person had the same problem I had with my mail. It went to Oakdale, uh, went to cent uh, Central Ice Slip, uh, went to Central Ice again before I got to hop up. So it's got three, and that's why the stick in the corner, which is covered, was, is sort of upside down because it was actually a, sig a significant peril. And this is where we are. Uh, to many students, this is kind of odd um, to be able to look at where we are from the air. Um, and I always bring back the fact that I used to say when you get to a map, map and you don't know west and east because people have that problem, just write the word we on the map and you've got W and you've got E because kids on Long Island growing up had a problem with going east because that was going to the country. From here, from Hopog, when you went east, that was the farming area. And yet when you teach American history, go west, young man, go west. You went to the west, you're going to the city. So on Long Island, you had a sort of little mind game that you played uh, dealing with going east or going west. Um, and we are smack dab, really right smack in the middle of Long Island. Um, again, Montauk Point on that, that point. Again, I have some great stories of people going to do a project going to Montauk Point and going to Orient, you know, going to the wrong spot. Uh, or one young lady, when I asked where the East River was, she actually made a line between Queens and Nassau County uh, because she said, when we went to the city, we go, over a river. Oh, the, but that's not the river. That's just, see, Long Island is Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. I try and have you understand that because where is Long Island City? Queens. Is it that kind of? All right. I'm not going to test you. It's going to be just a little bit closer view. Now you see the North Shore of Long Island and Smithtown Bay. And there, obviously, from the air, you always get that. Obviously, Blydenburg Park and the mill, which is obviously substantial. I didn't touch any. I didn't do it. Sorry. Uh, and that's pretty much where the high school is. Uh, so you're looking for the center of Hopog. Hopog really is, for all intents and purposes, really a school district. It's a village. Uh, it's about 10.5 square miles. Uh, last census um, in 2010, we didn't do that in 2020, was about 20,000 people uh, living in the Hopog area. So that's where we are here. A little bit zeroed in. You can see Northern State Parkway, Sag to Coast coming that way, Northern State again coming in in that direction. And all the pockets of water without touching the screen, you can see them all. Those little, little black markings around um, that sort of indicate that Long Island is the sort of the area of sweet water or overflowed land. Let's deal with the Native Americans. They were here. The name Hopog is. Uh, Algonquin. They spoke the name Lenny Lenape. As I said earlier, they came to this area to settle in the wintertime because it was protected. They moved away from the beach. Um, everybody, if you go to the, anybody gone to the Shinnecock uh, powwow? Okay, they have teepees. We didn't have those. Okay, so forget all that stuff out there. That's not Long Island Indians. We had wigwams. We did not have long headdresses that had whole loads of feathers. That was not our style. Um, we were made out of thatched, really thatched huts that were kicking around here. We did have a Mohawk style. Um, some of them would be uh, of this uh, sort of vintage uh, where they would use reeds uh, from the salt marsh, which you would not have had out in Arizona. Um, so this would have been typical of a Long Island uh, area. Again, there was no metal tools at this stage of the game. They had to be very small to get into them. Yeah, just um, all of their uh, boating uh, was uh, made out of wood, usually tulip trees from what we can gather. There was one that actually sat 30 warriors that was out on the east end. They found one this is in the 1800s. So we can imagine that uh, the Indians in this immediate area who were on the sound, who would have done fishing, would have used a dugout um, and it would have been similar to this. This is a map that actually is from further south uh, in the sort of the uh, northeast. Uh, down near Virginia where they did this drink, but that would be typical of what you would have seen um, in the Long Island area uh, for the Indians that were here. That, again, the Indians, I'll go back one, um, the Indians who were here, 
uh, at this stage of the game uh, were very, very peaceful. Um, they had their own language. Uh, that they, they were part of the 13 uh, bands of Indians that extend from Brooklyn uh, all the way out to Montauk Point. Uh, the Nessequake Indians were the ones that were here. That was the tribe or the band of Indians. Sometimes we, most um, historians of the Native American group dislike when I used to say tribes, uh, they would like to say extended family units. But when you're talking to high school kids, extended family units sounds like you have a stepbrother. So I just sort of left that out um, and you still use the term tribe. So the group Indians that were here were the Nessequake Indians uh, and their great chief was, Wyand Anch was the great chief of all of Long Island, uh, except for a guy in, in Brooklyn, Mongatuski, but Wyand Anch ruled all of Suffolk County. But our guy was, later became a little segment of area too. Good, Wisconsin. Nesconset was the sachem for the Nesquake Indians in this region. So you had a, a character who ruled in this immediate area, and he's the character that ultimately will be the one that will sort of negotiate with our good friend, um, Lion Gardner. He was the grand sachem, if you want to deal with it, specific terms. And I'll give you some um, books that might be more explicit at the end and they might be able to zero into, but Wayne Dinch was sort of the grand sachem. So he was sort of, if you're dealing with the federal level, he's President Biden, and then you have governors of states. And so you had local characters who were in charge of this little area. But overall, if Wayne Dinch asked for a favor, you gave it to him. He was the most powerful character. He was actually one of three brothers who ruled Long Island, but he seemed to be the one that held on the longest uh, and got the most notoriety. He ultimately will be the one supposedly that signs the deed, um, grants um, this area, or at least half of the area, to um, uh, our good old friend, Mr. Smith, um, Rich, or Richard Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H-E, not Smith with an I, but we changed that because it looked better for us in his books, but it was S-M-Y-T-H-E as he signed his name. Uh, and we had this lovely bull, five tons bronze bull. Um, and everybody knows the illustrious story. Um, Richard Smythe was born in 1613. Uh, he gets on a boat uh, called the London uh, in 1635. And the London is supposed to sail to St. Kitts, uh, which is a little island off of uh, if you know where the Virgin Islands are, and then there's the British Virgin Islands, and then you have all the little islands going all the way down to Grenada, all the way down to South America. Uh, St. Kitts is one of the islands that's sort of up in that little swing. Um, I don't think he ever made it there, uh, because by 1637, uh, he's in Massachusetts. So somewhere along on either he went to St. Kitts and then came back to Massachusetts, or got off the boat in Massachusetts. But either way, in 1637, he's in the colonies. Understand this is only 17 years after the Mayflower. So get your, that's pretty early. That's not, not late covers. This is not 1860. This is not somebody settling California. This is early, early. He then goes from Massachusetts. Um, by 1643, he's in Southampton. Now, South, Southampton was settled in 1640. So he's not one of the first guys, but he gets there in 1643. He has some problems there and is thrown out of Southampton. Uh, for, um, <clears throat> I think, cursing at somebody or giving someone who was an official character not the right panache that he was supposed to do so. And he goes to Setauket. Uh, and he's there in 1659 um, when he witnesses the transfer of land from Wyandanche to uh, Lion Gardner. And I don't want to confuse you here. Let me back up. Wyandish, who we talked about just initially, had a, uh, his order, Heather Flower. I'm not going to give you the Indian name because it's just Heather Flower, the most beautiful Indian princess of all of Long Island. But remember, he was the most powerful Indian chief. So no one's going to say, your daughter, you know, is, you know, so understand the context we're dealing with there. Um, she is stolen, kidnapped by the evil um, Pequo chief um, who is in Connecticut. Uh, and Nigret was the chief who took her and held her for ransom. Wyandanch is a guest at this thing, I want my daughter back. He arranges for Lyon Gardner to go over uh, and turn over some of the ransom to get his daughter back. He is so thrilled that he gets his daughter back after Lyon Gardner intercedes on his behalf uh, that he gives um, Richard Mythe the land along the Nessequag River. That's what he does in a deed. 
the year after Wyandanche signs the signature to Lion Gardner, Wyandanche dies. A year later, Lion Gardner is to pass away, okay, and but he give the land to his brother, excuse me, his son David. There's no deed thing there, but it's recognized that this deed was, was transferred. He knows of it. Uh, some people believe that uh, Richard Smythe may have witnessed the signing of the deed. Um, there are some characters who've told me he probably, he may have won the land in a card game, which is one heck of a way to go through it. But remember, he was out in Southampton, he's now in Setauket. You're not gonna get in your Porsche and move from Southampton to go visit your property in the Nesquik. That's a good distance. Um, but as it goes, Richard Smythe is going to be given the land to a gardener grant to own the area of Smith. Why? He had another problem in Setauket with a guy by the name of Mr. Young. He seems to be always in court. That's the one thing I tell you about Richard Smythe. He's always in court for something. I don't think I ever had a three-year period where he wasn't in court for something. Um, and uh, so he now get the land, but the trouble is he's now got Wisconsin to deal with. Where, where mum did? Where mum wine did signature? I assume no wine gets in. No, because the deed got lost. Um, so he has to make a deal with the Indians. He's got the white man's version of it, but now he says, okay, I'm going to get on my bull and I'll show you where my land is. Ta-da! <clears throat> so... Wine Gardner, uh, obviously I'm giving the land. Richard Smythe now leaves Stony Brook Harbor, joins all the way down to Town Line Road, cuts along Town Line Road, goes all the way up, goes, gets to the end, and then scoots up Bread and Cheese Hollow Road, which is the boundary between Huntington and Smithtown, <clears throat> and that's his property. Pretty good, huh? On a bull, not known for speed. So what? how does the tail go? Does anybody know? He waits till the longest day of the year, June 21st, now he's going to make it. The bull's going through the woods. You know, I, he's going to do and in a day. He had all the land that he can circumnavigate in one day was going to be his. I, I love the story. No other town has a bull. It's a cute story. It's delightful. But it's not, I don't think it's accurate. I think what we're dealing with here is terminology. My father used to say, that'll blow your socks off. People would say these things. Would you just bite the bullet, please? <laughs> Ultimately, I think getting on your bull meant he was going to make a strong statement. At this particular period of time in 17th century, what you had was papal bulls, which were coming out from the Pope, who was telling you where the land and divisions between dioceses were. So more than likely, um, Richard Smythe knew what a bull was and knew what was happening. But you've got this whole thing waiting till the longest day of the year, and it's, it's 66 miles. I've, I've walked with leukemia groups, and in five miles, I'm walking next to the ice cream truck to hang on, and I'm doing that in the day. This guy's doing 66 miles on a bull in one day period. I, I don't tend to buy that. I think it's just the terminology, getting on your bull and doing it. But when I used to do this in Smithtown, there'd always be somebody, with, we got a five-ton bull down. What the hell are we going to do with, you know, I it didn't like me destroying the story. So I think I can tell that in Hubbard, but if I move to Smith down, then the story gets real. And the name of the bull is? Whisper. Whisper. Where do we get Whisper from? That was the winning bid in 1910 by school kids who had the name Richard's Bull, and the winner was Whisper. There's no historical basis of that at all. You don't, and you don't name, you don't name your farm animals. Anybody who knows in farming, you know, I, I remember asking my uncle, you know, what's, you know, what's the sheep's name? He said, you don't name sheep, you're going to eat. All right, we're going to eat Larry. <laughs> so you would not have named your bull at that stage of the game. <laughs> Whisper, if ultimately on down the line, he may become on your dinner table. Okay, I'll try to pick up speed. I could get lost here. Okay, here's the sort of the division line. We're gonna, this sort of town line road, which is gonna sort of sco scoot through here. Town line road is sort of a, a goofy uh, uh, item because there was a dispute between Islip and, and Smithtown over what the division line was. And it was a, a difference of one rod, which in old terminology means about 16 feet. And so what they did was they decided to divide rod and give Islip part 
and give Smithtown part. So you got this dividing line that goes through. And this section, I'm so embarrassed. Oh, you're gonna be back. Um, this section uh, is gonna be the town line road section. And it was amazing when I first came to uh, Hopog as a teacher in 1969 during the winter, there'd be some times where the Smithtown side of town line roads plowed, but not Iceland. And I'm going, this is the dumbest thing. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Never put a road between two towns because you've got two departments of the highway trying to clear the thing. And you'd find the guys from Iceland taking on the Smithtown side and the cars are going. I said that was bizarre. So ultimately that was sort of said. But I always thought it was interesting uh, that town line road was that sort of unique difference between. Uh, and people, when they say you're from Hopak, I said, you know, immediately there's this coordination that you have to make between two. See, I got here. Now, the first character I can find living in Hopa is a fellow by the name of Thomas Wheeler. And Thomas Wheeler was down on um, uh, Route 111 and Engineer's Path. Uh, but there's no pictures of his house. It was probably about 1731. The earliest one I can find is Timothy Wheeler, still a Wheeler, uh, who's going to build his house um, on between Town Line Road uh, and Route 111, which at that time was King's Highway. So where it divides there is where this house stood from approximately 1751 to about 1930, round or about. Uh, in fact, it was 1929. I'm so embarrassed. Uh, and if I can show you that, this is that house. This is the turn going down. This is, this is going to be Town Line Road. All those trees there, we'll see a little bit later on, but Timothy Wheel's house is gonna be smack dead in the middle here. I don't know whether this is working it right way. Go back, go back, don't do that. I'm technically challenged, you have to understand that. Let's see if I can go back. No, we're not at the revolution yet. Okay, that was the one I took. See, there's the Texaco gas station uh, and Timothy Wheel's house was right there. Um, in 1929, it still blew up in the basement and the house burned, so it was never able to be saved. Now, this is the current one. And you can tell I took this picture a uh, long time ago because the gas prices are 231. Now it's BP. Yeah, now it, yes, the, accurate. Yes, now it's BP. Went from, I'm so embarrassed. I should have updated that and take off points at the end. <laughs> Okay, um, so we will become um, the town of Wheeler, believe it or not, all the way up until the early 1800s. Nobody called us Hopog until after that time period. So the Wheelers were the characters who were here. And even though there were Blydenburgs and there were Siths and there were hubs uh, kicking around in this immediate area, um, the Wheelers got it. And almost all of our roads were established based on the character who was here. Let's go up Blydenburg Road. When you start thinking it, Let's go up Caleb Smith's path. We just, we'll go up Wheeler Road. No, let's go up Old Wheeler Road. You know, you have these names that are specifically related uh, to the people that were here in the early years. Revolution, we'll find us in 1776 with people who are involved on both sides. Um, Long Island seems to be split. It's about, well, I shouldn't say split. About one third was in favor of breaking away with England. About one third wanted to be loyal and one third really didn't care what was happening. Pretty much what this group is like. One third in favor of what I'm doing, one third had nothing to do tonight, and one third holding on for something else. So ultimately on down, what you have uh, is a, a character, but the, the when Long Island is lost in August of 1776, that's the Battle of Long Island, the British marked up King's Highway uh, and came into Hopog, immediately ransacked a number of houses. Uh, Mr. Blydenburg's house was the one he had actually joined uh, the revolutionary cause and had fought the Battle of Long Island in August, which we lost to the British, which is why Long Island was now going to be occupied. This was the only place that was occupied from 1776 right right through the end of the war in 1783. So the British came up, they ransacked Mr. Blydenburg's house. Um, there was a fellow by the name of Joshua Wheeler. They went to his house and asked for his, uh, his cattle. Now, in Hopog, we had a little dip down where you have St. Tosmore Church. Uh, they used to call that York Lots uh, place. And it was sort of naturally had wooded area all the way around. And then there was sort of open field with grass. And everybody kept their cattle there. And when the British came and said to Wheeler, we need your cattle, we want your cattle. He said, well, they're in York. The characters thinking he meant New York left him alone. But the cattle was still in North York. You know, North Lots, obviously, kicking around near St. Thomas Church. Uh, and so the British were here for the entire war. Um, but there were, again, there were Long Islanders who fought 
uh, for indeed uh, here. Here's a, a, a shot of Town Line Road. Um, I show you this. I actually, why I did this, I don't know, but this is one of the old, just from about 1908. It's actually a group of hot dog kids uh, standing. I don't know whether you can see it. They're all the way down the end down here. There's actually a postcard of those characters uh, that I did not bring, but uh, I probably should have. But they all stood there while the photographer, again, Miss Price, was taking his pictures. Now, this is uh, one from the 1950s. You notice anything? We're missing trees. I'll go back one, watch what happens here. The church, by the way, is just, can you see the cemetery where the kids are? You can see the stones on the other side. So the Methodist church is just gonna be just down there a bit. And that, that's gonna be built in 19, uh, excuse me, 1806. Um, but this is Town Line Road. And then this is from about 1950s. And I'm looking at, I was always thought that this tree is gonna be in the next shot, but I think it's that tree over there. And I tried to walk to the exact same spot. You can see I actually have nothing to do with my time. Um, and uh, there's one tree left. And, uh, and you can still see the church right there. See the steeple going up right behind it. Uh, so it has obviously changed immensely at that stage of the game um, from what it used to be. There's the church. Might as well start with that one. Um, in 18, I think I said 1806, it's 1809. Methodist Church was organized and built on land that was donated by the Smiths, by the way. Uh, even though he was Presbyterian, he figured might as well cover all his bases. Um, and he put up land for Catholic Church, put up land for Presbyterian churches, put up land for Methodist churches on down the line. Um, and this is probably from the Hopog High School property, looking across to the Methodist Church. This is the Methodist Church in the distance. This is the Cornish house. That house is still standing. Uh, it's now an office building. They've got little buggy dormers on the top. When you go by the church, look at the next little house that's right next to it, and you'll see two little doggy dormers on the top of a very small house. It's an office, but the Cornish house, which was again built in the late 1790s, uh, is still there. This is neat. This is a, a fellow by the name of Hubs who's in this little uh, Slide. It's a nice picture from really about the turn of the century. What I find interesting about this picture uh, is that the sled is now in the Long Island Museum on Stony Brook, uh, along with the picture. So get over to the what used to be the Long Island Carrot Museum, if I remember, now it's the Long Island Museum. Uh, that sled was donated by uh, Smith along with this picture. So that makes it really neat. And the steeple on the church was added in, 17, in 1895. I just, there was a day I was leaving school and the hot bar department was very nicely doing some work on it, which is really nice. Now, if you're standing in the middle of the field trying to get a picture of the church, all you get is the post office. And I couldn't get past the fence <clears throat> without making the picture just look obscene. But obviously there's been a lot of development along that way. Uh, I suggest you walk through the graveyard. I know that sounds odd, um, but you learn a lot. Uh, Timmy Wheeler, veteran of the war of 1812. Uh, it's born in Smithtown, but he was born in Hopog. Uh, died in Brooklyn. Uh, you get, uh, I always like this one, Phoebe, wife of Richard Wheeler. Phoebe gets the same title as her husband at the same level. I like it once Phoebe's like in two, two things and then the guy she's married to is in huge number, you know. Phoebe, the wife of Richard Wheeler, you know, gets it. Uh, but this is very, very early. You learn a lot about a place uh, from looking at a narrow grave. Here's Thomas Conklin. Uh, he was the, and on his gravestone is the first postmaster of Hopog. That's what he wanted on his gravestone. So it's interesting, which is much better than uh, I was out uh, just to go in another direction. I was out in Kutchog a year ago looking at uh, gravestones, trying to figure out where they were from. Some of them were from Connecticut, red sandstone. Some of them had come from New Jersey. They were schist and marble. But on a red one gravestone and the, the was this woman and the, the caption was, I told you I was sick, Elizabeth. And I, I fell down laughing hysterically. I couldn't move warning this morning. You know, I just don't feel good. You're fine. You're fine. There's nothing. I just don't feel right. So ultimately on her grave, I don't know, it just caught me. I guess it's my warped sense of humor. Uh, here's George uh, L.F. Booth. Uh, he was in the 127th New York uh, Volunteers in the Civil War. So we have uh, Hapagians who fought with the Union in the Civil War, um, buried there. Uh, here is Mr. Booth. 
uh, very nicely, his family donated his picture to the Smithtown Historical Society. So I love the connection between looking at Mr. Booth, who was a hot dog farmer, came back after the Civil War and continued his farming routine. And he was here. Um, and this is West Payne. I thought this was quite sad, put it by his family. He was a corporal uh, in the 139th New York uh, State Volunteers. Uh, and it's tough to see, but he was killed at Fort Hamilton in Virginia. Uh, and he's buried there, but the family put up a marker. So you get these connections in history. You can actually see the families that were in Hopog and what they're doing at the time. There's another graveyard. Um, this is the Wheeler graveyard. And uh, I didn't know about this for many, many years. It's behind Hirsch Fuel. On if you're going down 110 with that, they used to call it Dead Man's Turn, where you go down and make that dead turn. Um, that is back of Hirsch Fuel is this Wheeler graveyard. Uh, and it is was in various repair until a few years ago, uh, a, a young gentleman who was a Boy Scout did it as an Eagle project. I happened to mention it in school. And he went over, picked out it as his project and cleaned up this whole Wheeler Cemetery. You can see the Hirsch Fuel truck in the back and the graves that were there. Question. On Town Line Road, on the north side. That's Mrs. Blyberg's. It's on the south, this one's on the south side. And it's on the 7-Eleven side. I'll get to that. I, maybe I've got the wrong one. Maybe I've, I'll, but I will attempt to, uh, when we get to Bledenburg's house, we'll see if we can do it. You can? You may have something I don't know, so. Okay. We'll, we'll chit chat at the end. I'll leave five minutes a week. Since we're talking about churches and the Methodist Church, uh, this is one, uh, this is the Roman Catholic Church. This is St. Pat's. Okay, St. Pat's was originally in Hopog, and it was uh, on uh, Mount Pleasant Road. Um, here you've got, this is an old map from the 60s. Uh, this would be, this, would, oh, come on, Gish, don't do that. I'm so embarrassed. Trying to go back here, not going back. There we are. Okay, you have, there's a, a Mount Pleasant Road. If you cross, uh, obviously, 347 at this time called Port Jefferson uh, Highway. If you go up Mount Pleasant, cross the highway, there's a cemetery up on the corner of Cross Street, which is, you can also reach it from going up Hopog Road, okay, and go cross Cross Street. That's a cemetery. That's where the church was. It was built in uh, 1848. Um, the Irish were coming over in the 1830s. Obviously, you can have the potato famine. Uh, and so in Hopog, you had a number of Catholics who were there. Uh, and so the church was built. Did I go give you that one? Okay. This was the modified version. I don't know whether you can see from the older one. Uh, I'll go back. This is the original church. You're going to see that nice little sort of uh, Tiffany widow that'll come in up top when they sort of did an upgrade of that church in 1878. See it? Okay. And when you go up, the cemetery is still there. Okay. But what do you see when you get to the cemetery? You don't see the church. The white cross is where the church was. That's where the altar stone was. So the altar stone was on that, was in that cemetery. And that's also where Father Murphy's buried. He's the, the pastor of the church, St. Pat, so through the 30s. He then moved up to Smithtown. Um, and that's sort of a, an interesting story, too, um, and I'll get to it here, uh, because the Ku Klux Klan were on Long Island, uh, and I find that the Ku Klux Klan on Long Island was um, not as much anti-Black on Long Island as they were anti-Catholic and anti-Jewish. Uh, the Klan was uh, against alcohol, which made them really going along with government prohibition in the 20s. Um, they were pure womanhood. Uh, I love that term, um, but they, they were very act Ku Klux Klan uh, activities in the immediate area. I will tell you that when I did the book on Smithtown history, the, the, uh, the historical society didn't want me to include the Ku Klux Klan in the history. Um, but I couldn't do that because then that would be just redefined history. And so 
but by a vote of four to three, um, they kept me on the project. Uh, and um, I didn't want to tell them that one of the biggest meetings I ever heard about was from Gil Hubs. Some of you may remember him. Gil Hubs is, was a character I interviewed way back in the 70s. Uh, and he attended a, a large a Ku Klux Klan meeting on the property of the high school um, in 1927. Uh, and they had a burn cross. They took the, uh, lugged a piece of iron in, he said, and they wrapped it all with uh, oil rags and then lit it in the middle of the field. He said it was eerie. He was probably, he said about 12 years old. And all the cars circled the field and all had their headlights on. So it was sort of this eerie Model T sort of feeling. Um, and uh, he watched this whole thing take place. Now, I'll tell you that Ku Klux Klan did burn um, uh, three crosses on uh, Murphy's um, uh, sort of house, shouldn't say house. Priests live in the rectory, thank you very much. Um, and so three crosses were burned there. Also, Mr. Donaldson, Donaldson had a general store in Hopog, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, crosses were burned on his property too. I never found anybody that said he was Jewish, but there's a good reason to believe his turned his second uh, shop into a place where the Jews could meet on Long Island, or at least in Hopog area, Temple Beth Kai, which ended up moving just down Town Line Road from where his store was. And his third store, when I was still teaching, was still standing, and that was Temple Beth Kai, no longer his store, and that was there. So the Ku Klux Klan burned uh, crosses on his property uh, and on the Catholics out here. Um, and it is, um, they were abundant. Uh, I don't know whether anybody can recognize this picture. But this is the church in Smithtown. This is the Episcopal Church in St. James. If you go to it, it has the same outside. And when I got this picture, a woman came in and gave this to me when I was doing my research. And she said, I'll give you these pictures of the clan, but you can't say who they're from. Because I have grandkids in the area. And I, you know, I said, I won't do it. So, but I ended up having to include it only because of the fact that here it is, it's St. James and they're having a funeral uh, in, the, in the Episcopal church and the clansmen are unmasked. So they were not hiding from anybody. People knew who they were, uh, and you have indeed people in helping. I, I actually found policemen uh, in, in the pictures of the clans that I had on the island here. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, repeat. Uh, this is in the 20s. Uh, it seems that the clan seems to lose it once prohibition ends. I find them uh, losing a lot of popularity. And I think Hopog was becoming very uh, eclectic in its environment. You had Irish moving in. If Mr. Donaldson was Jewish, you had a number of Blacks were already into the Hopkins area uh, doing work at the Blydenburg um, mill. So it was, it was going to be very difficult for you to be sort of on one of these sites. Um, first school in Hopkins. I didn't teach there, regardless of what they'd say. Um, amazingly enough, it's the same time period as the church, 1806. So you got 1806 and 1806 is the church. That was the first one. Next one is 1848. You can see the kids are getting a little bit um, numerous. Not going to tell you. This is the second, the second church in 1848. This is moving up day. On the back of this photograph from Hot Bog, it didn't say graduation day. And the woman explained to me, oh, no, at the end of the year, everybody moved up. We didn't call it graduation. So fifth grade went to sixth grade, sixth grade went to seventh grade. And I've never actually had that conversation with anybody about a moving up day, but that's sort of the graduation period. But I thought that picture, everybody's in their best hat. Everybody's smiling. It must have, except for this kid here who must have got left back on the end there. Uh, this is 1896, the next school. And on the side of it, it's tough to read here, but it does say, uh, district number six on that side of the panel of this. So this is 1896. And all of these schools were on. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you. This is Schoolhouse Lane. This is Schoolhouse Lane. <laughs> it's still there. It just has a stop sign on it now and a turn, so it works out well. But it's amazing when you when I talk to young people about this in school, it didn't equate. Schoolhouse Lane 
you know, could be anything on down the line. It just didn't equate with schools. Uh, this is 1911. We're getting really big here now. Uh, this was, uh, again, not on schoolhouse land. Uh, but this will be, again, when we talk about Hopog, we have to talk about school district because it really is. It's a school district that just happens to be uh, in a 10 square mile area uh, with 20,000 people that are going to it. Uh, this stood until um, 1963 when we no longer needed it. This stood on Town Line Road. Um, and uh, the school district no longer needed it and the land was going to be uh, sold. Uh, so this little building that had been boarded up uh, was put on fire and burned down. Uh, the Hot Bog Fire Department wanted to practice putting out building fires. I, I don't take that as, as, there was not a move towards preservation at that stage of game. I don't hold them responsible. They were thinking that Hot Bog would be developed and this would be a good way. They were trying to think, should we take it down? Should we demolish it? Would it cost more money? So let's let the fire department practice. Uh, it was brick and, uh, and um, wood at the stage of the game, so this was taken down. The middle school was at that time the high school, middle school, and high school uh, built again in the 1950s, which is why the other building sort of became uh, um, they, uh, no longer necessary. Obviously, you're looking at Lincoln Boulevard that turned still dead. Okay, and but the middle school is there from the top uh, with a few more additions. Sure, this is uh, again, Town Line Road down there. There's the middle school. You've got extensions there. You've got the Quonset huts that went up on the other side. This is Lincoln Boulevard. What's this? A high school property. It was a potato field. So those uh, boys who thought they were uh, Real studs during those years were actually spuds. <laughs> uh, that didn't go over big and class either, but it was, I, I always thought it was it, so I'm not worried. Uh, this was, uh, I had a snow day um, and I had a graduate student uh, who, who has, was in the uh, um, college and he agreed to take me up in his plane if I paid for the gas. Uh, so I took a picture of the high school, the new high school now. Um, at this stage of the game. And those of you who know the high school know that the courtyard is all developed in the section. There's a huge athletic complex on this side. Um, remember I talked about um, um, our good old friend, uh, Wal uh, Wallace Donaldson, who's gonna open up a general store. And I'll show you his general store is right here. Here's the church. You can see that right there. The Cornish house where that little sled was taken is right there. That's going to be the third Jewish synagogue or place where, where it was at that stage of the game. You see, here's the intersection. Here's, see the difference? Town Line Road. There's only a gas station. There's no hop on post office. There's no bagel place. There's nothing along here. And this is early 70s. I think it's 72 if I check my notes, um, which is now, oh, I, uh, 50 years ago. Yeah, I guess that's... Boy, that just hit me like a ton of bricks real quick there. Uh, and this is a washed out shot uh, that obviously um, uh, I'm gonna sort of have to explain, but you can see the high school in the middle. Okay, town line roads running here, going all the way out to Lake Ronkonkoma. Lake Ronkonkoma is owned by the town of Islip, the town of Smithtown and Brookhaven. So you've got a lake that's owned by three towns and the bottom was until the mid seventies privately owned. Think about that. So you've got Town Line Road, Lincoln Boulevard. You've got the hill. Can you see the hill here? This is a marina. Let's, I'm going to take you up the hill and over the hill to the expressway. So you're going to go up and over the hill. So there you have Lincoln Boulevard coming down. And see this little open space right here? That's the library, where the library is today. That's where you are. You're right here, right next to the Dunkin' Donuts, which you don't see either. Uh, but this is a, a, a nice shot showing Hopog at a much earlier time. No, uh, I would say that Hopog was an area that uh, from the 50s right straight up until the 80s was an area that people wanted to come to because it was it had a great uh, education 
image a number of uh, elementary schools that were built with intention. If you look at a, a lot of other communities, they were built, oh, we need a school, uh, where should we put it? Hopog was the only, and I'll get to that probably at the end. There was a fellow by the name of Lee Koppelman, who was the Nass County, Nassau Suffolk County building guy. Yes, he is. He's 94 and he's still teaching uh, at Southbrook University in Urban Affairs. Interesting guy. I interviewed him on numerous occasions, but Hopog was the only community that took his plan. He, when he, remember, Suffolk County government began in 1960. Not that old. Our first, our first Suffolk County executive was H. Lee Dennison. Then it was John Klein. Then it was Peter Cole Hallen. I mean, it's going to be narrow. You've only got like six or seven on down the line here to get up to the present day. So what you have here is um, this situation where when he comes in and says, look, I got a great plan. Hopog should buy this, this, this. You got to leave a huge section for industry. Industrial Park. Well, as you know, and you will, you will blossom if you do all this. I'll set it on. I'll show you that at the end if I have enough time. See what we got. Um, this is uh, interesting. This is the uh, Joshua Smith House. Uh, this was built um, uh, in an area that today is the Sunnydale Homes. If anybody knows where that is, I'll get to that in a second then if you don't. But this was built um, in the 1790s. It was originally a salt box. Uh, it was then converted in about 1819 during the presidency of James Monroe uh, into this sort of gambled roof design. Uh, again, modified on a couple of occasions, but it was an absolutely magnificent structure. When this picture was taken, this was taken by the federal government. This house uh, was listed as one of the 100 most important architectural buildings in the nation in 1960. Uh, this was the Joshua, like I said, the Joshua Smith House for its, uh, for its building. It was magnificent. There was attempts to try and save it. That was not successful. However, uh, Henry DuPont came up from Winterthur and took the interior out. So if you want to see the interior of a Hopog house that he thought was important, go down to Winterthur in Delaware, and he's got it in the China room. I find that to be amazing that we're going to take on this house that's listed by the federal government as one of the most important architectural houses in America at that stage. Uh, and it ends up getting turned out. But that was the, you know, we were going for advancement. We were trying to proceed. And at that time, it was owned by Richard Zorn. Okay. Richard Zorn uh, owned um, the turkey farm here in Hapa. If you wanted a turkey, you came to Zorn's turkey farm. Uh, that was here. Here is the house. Can you see it? Okay, remember where I mentioned the 1911 school? The 1911 school they took down is down here. That's on Town Line Road, okay, coming up this way. And that's now the Maloney Funeral Home. That's on the property where the Maloney Funeral Home is, is where this last school was before they built the middle school and then the high school. This one you see, this was again, the preservation of the Knights of the Templar that became the village hall for a while and then became the Knights of Columbus. Again, this is yes, this is no. They're recognized, otherwise we're all in limbo here. It'd be just like my seventh period way back in 204. So you have the, uh, you have the little house that's right here. Uh, and that was taken down when they improved the motor parkway section and did all that neat little thing on down the line. That turn was still horrific. They're going. So, this house was knocked down along with that one. This became the Sunnydale Homes. And based on this, and these are all the turkeys, by the way, in the back. Of, these are all turkey sheds. Um, yep, it was back there. And then they sold, and this is the, where I believe the original house was. This is uh, 27 Mary Vale Lane uh, in Hopog in the Sunnydale section. So why I took this, I don't know, but I felt nostalgic. Yeah, they built a zillion houses in that section, but the Zorn sold it for a significant amount of money. But if you wanted to go, um, again, look at that other one that I showed you, this was the old St. Thomas Knights of Columbus, but this was originally built as the uh, preservation of the Knights of the Templar, which was a, um, a temperance group that started in 1887. Uh, and so they would have their little meetings there. Again, don't do drinking. It's bad. you all the way on down the line. Uh, and then ultimately it became a hot box town hall, which seems to be very significant, non-drinking to a town hall. But anyway, uh, and then ultimately it became St. Thomas's more. Yeah. Yes, same family. 
in fact, let me see if I can, I don't know whether I've got that on here. I thought I did, but there's Zorn's turkeys in Hopog. I got this from Richard Zorn um, way back when he raised them. And you know where the chemical pool place was? That's where they used to sell the turkeys at. Okay, that was Zorn's, that was his, that was his little shop that sold all the turkeys. So, yes, it is. So it's opening if you'd like to go sell turkeys. You know, the whole nostalgic people, and there'll probably be three of us in the room that remember that. Uh, this is Mr. Donaldson's uh, general store. Uh, again, I mentioned to you, he may have been uh, one of the first Jewish residents of, uh, of Hopog. It says Hopog for 34 years, the village store, post office, and residents of Wallace Donaldson. Wallace Donaldson lived next door, but that was his shop. It was struck by lightning and burned uh, at 11.30 p.m. August 10th, 1904. Uh, but then he built his second shop, which was right there. And he existed there right through the 30s. Uh, and then ultimately built, well, I should tell you this, this is what he sold. We have devoted much time in studying the one of our customers with unsurpassed facilities. We are able to meet what would be the articles and undertakes and undersell us. We have light expenses, no electric light. <laughs> we have light, light expenses, no electric light. You're trying to be humorous. No water privileges. Uh, we can do and buy cheap and sell cheap. We carry as large as well as assorted stock of standard goods as there are in this country. We sell lower than ever before. And this is Wallace H. Donaldson, obviously, Hopog, um, Long Island, New York. Uh, and this is one of his um, receipts. Uh, you could get a pound of coffee for 22 cents, a box of matches for five cents, um, a bag of flour for 40 cents. Uh, this is a pair of stockings for 15 cents. And I, I've looked at this nine times a day. I think it says one gutted herring. Um, so one gutted herring, can you see it? Gut H E herring for 10 cents. I probably would have just gotten the second pair of stockings. Go ahead. <laughs> Brick. No. It's quite possible that Donaldson may have sold that off to them. Yeah. In fact, this was his third store. And this was Hempel Beth Kai. Yeah, they were two. Uh, okay. Then, if that's the case. Then you're probably putting this whole story together. We'll have to chit chat. Um, so this was one, and this was I took this picture in the 80s, uh, but I think it was taken down in 1982 or 83, um, and uh, it was replaced by the veterinary building. Does everybody know where the veterinary building? I don't know whether I showed in the big in that overview. I showed you that little building in the back, and that was Donaldson's store, and it was all behind here. So if you make that turn there, you know where you are. This was Donaldson's store. Somebody had had the post, uh, not postcard, but just a uh, photograph. This was the uh, next post office. What is it today? The firehouse. Thank you. It, they painted it white. It's right across from the contemporary post office today. So when you're going past the firehouse, look at the White House that just passed it. That was the post office. At least it was saved. I'm that. I think that was a plus. Nice brick building. Uh, there's the post office today. Just so you know, it's next to Bagel Bus. Yes. Okay, across across from the high school was uh, was Mr. Blydenberg's house. Um, and uh, he had a wonderful structure there. The house, first house was built in the 1700s. Uh, this one's going to come on a little bit later. Um, Mr. Bledenberg uh, and his wife Ruth owned a significant amount of land along there. In fact, if you go down Town Line Road, that's the cemetery I'm talking about. It's on the north side of the road and it's tucked in. And so you took Mrs. Bledenberg's house, which is on the corner of Route 111 and Town Line Road, right across from high school. Just go right across from high school. On that corner, east corner, was Mrs. Bladenberg. She moved her family cemetery. At this stage of the game, you could have a family cemetery on your own property. You had enough property, can't do it now because of the Suffolk County Water Authority, but at one particular time, but if you go back to this piece of property, you'll find Charity Bladenberg, uh, who died in 1795. Uh, she's buried on that. There's probably about 12 to 15 graves, and, that's, and people pass it all the time. 
Okay, then we have to chit chat. Okay, this is on the north side. Yes, ma'am. North side of town line. Okay, we'll we'll get through that. This is what the house becomes. Uh, this was the um, Brooklyn Locustdale Home of Children. There was an orphanage in Brooklyn, and in the summertime, they took the kids out here. They broke the orphanage into two sections, and they carted them out to hop on. Uh, and uh, the local ladies groups would have a social teas for them and ice cream days, uh, and they would take them to Lake Ronkonkoma. Uh, so it worked out real well. I'll move real quick. Crystal, I don't have time. Sorry. Wordy. But again, I want to show you how the building... Uh, eh. I didn't do that right. Do you see what happened? Watch, watch this end of building and watch the development of this structure. The Locustdale Home for Children um, was very popular. And so they kept adding onto the building. Watch, the thing, and there's a Locustdale. Now watch the next one. Still going out and up. So you had this original structure uh, that was there when that picture was taken probably about 1890. And all of a sudden now it becomes the Locustdale Home. And it stood until 1958 where it was replaced by Robert Hall. I don't have a picture of Robert Hall. <laughs> so if anybody has a picture of Robert Hall <laughs> store, it's amazing. Why didn't you people take a picture of Robert Hall? No one did. No one. But ultimately it becomes town. And when I took this picture showing Jay Garden, Jay Garden's now closed. So Jay Garden, but it, it, that's the spot where the uh, Blydenburg house was on that particular corner. I can't leave out a story about Hop Hog without including the mills. Um, this was the only place on Long Island with three mills did three different things. There was a grain mill that ground corn into flour. Uh, there was a uh, saw mill that actually worked uh, and sawed lumber. And there was a fulling mill, a fulling mill which actually took uh, uh, wool and combed it so that it could be actually made into yarn and it was called a fulling mill. And that was the only place on Long Island where you had three mills operating out of the same, and they could actually change gears. If they wanted the sawmill to work, they switched this large thing in the sawmill. If they wanted to do grain, they switched the gear. It was almost a like transmission and they could do three things. But this was the infamous Bidenberg uh, site. Uh, this is the waterway that was backed up when they backed up the Nesquag River. This is not uh, natural. This is actually man-made. Um, and uh, this, um, the last one I should show you, uh, this was actually, go back, come on. Not go too far, I'm so embarrassed. This was actually the Presbyterian church that existed up on the Nesquag River before they built the Presbyterian church in the center of Smithtown. So they actually moved the Presbyterian church to be part of the mill um, complex. We, we didn't knock down houses, we moved them you find that that was the case really in the 17th and 18th century uh, all the way down. Great pictures of that one, Edinburgh Mills, even though it says Smithtown, all the characters from Hop Hog. Nice old pictures, obviously the sawmills working. Uh, this is um, Pig Scalding Day at the Blackenberg Mills. You can see African-American characters doing work uh, and scalding a pig was something you actually didn't want to get involved in. Yeah, they are hanging up on the outside. It was a way to take uh, boiling water and put it on the pig and remove the hair. Again, I'm talking to a group of people that probably do this, what, on a weekly basis. Just kidding. Just kidding. I'm going to get pork chops from Leo, and that's where it ends. When I first came to uh, Happy Hop Hog High, this was the condition of the mill. The state did a much better job, or the county, I should say, this is what it looks like today. I was very happy about that. Uh, that's the uh, Blydenburg Weld House. Who's, what's Weld got to do with it? The Weld family moved in after the Blydenburgs left. David Weld was born in that house and ended up being the governor of Massachusetts, William Weld. David Weld was the guy who bought it. William Weld was, this, I think I may have converted those two. David Weld bought the, from the Blydenbergs, but William Weld, his son born in that house, uh, was, uh, and when you go there, you'll see a sign that'll say Blydenberg Weld. And that's because the family did a lot of preserving in that section also. The Weld family married uh, into the Nichols family, which is a Smithtown name. And the Nichols family married a woman that I interviewed way back when. Uh, she was Floyd. So you had William Floyd and the Nichols 
and the welds were all sort of intermingled in that, and it's all hot bug history. You you want to raise them with flag? You cannot because I'm ten minutes. Okay, I mean it's this. I just some aerial views you might want to take a peek at. This is the mill here. This is where they backed it up. This was just really a part of the Nesquag River. And we I showed you the picture of the hill, Hopog Hill. When you come over that hill, you come into Hopog. Okay, lead the expressway over the hill. If all the rain that comes down that hill flows into the Nesquag River. If it falls on the other side of the hill, it's Good, the connect what? I'm not gonna, I only have 10 minutes, so I can't wait for an answer. So I'm gonna, I gotta, it's not gonna be quick. Okay, so you've got the state buildings and the county buildings are gonna be right there. And this is all backwater, all stump pond, uh, because they just flooded the woods and people who were fishing would catch their lines on the stumps. This, this is exactly like my seventh period class, the year I retired. They just were not gonna give me anything. Wintertime shot against Snow Day Hot Bug. So the opportunity now, now looking north, the Nesquag River would go here, up through the Nesquag State Park, and then out to Long Island Sound. The water flows north here, and from the Connecticut, it flows south. However, when you show a map, all students believe that the water flows to the floor. Maybe, maybe, maybe you thought that way too. Uh, this was an interesting shot. This is early 70s. Uh, I flew over the, um, the, the pond. Uh, you can see the state county buildings back here, county building here, state building would be here. And um, the, the lake was sudsing. This was before the phosphate ban in Suffolk County. And uh, I don't know whether it remembers the Smithtown Hospital was on, okay, on that corner. And they had dumping days where they dump all of the laundry water uh, from the hospital into the streams. All the streams led to here, the top of sweet water, overflowed land. And so the, on this particular day, the lake was sudsing, which I thought was sort of magical. Um, but it, it did help that the, uh, uh, my position on banning phosphates um, in Suffolk. Again, here you find county building is here, state building is there. Can you see the water in the middle? and pockets of water all through the immediate area, water. So this is, you see Smithtown Bypass going through there. You're looking north, again, uh, county building here and the state building there. And is it because of all the water? Yes, the, uh, the, in the state building, they don't want me to say this, in the state building, we go up the elevator, it creaks. That's because they, I thought this was going quite well. The, um, uh, when, the uh, when the elevator goes up the wall, it's sort of, creep up the wall because the building is sinking. They never should have built it there, but it's a marsh. And the guy went back up putting in the pilings. This is more information you need to know. But in putting in the pilings for that, uh, he sort of went back up. And another, well, that's good. I'll let it go. This was, this was Sanford's pond. This is a, a photograph. This was a, a, a lovely little pond that existed right next to the uh, um, state buildings. And they had to redo this when they put in the turn for, you can see it lovely, it had a lovely little bathhouse. It was Sanford Pond in Hopog. The Stanford family was here, really, he was up on, so if you're looking at a state buildings, it was over here. And they had to rework the water so they could put in the buildings. But Stanford Ponds was a nice little pond in the woods. And when I went to the woods to look where it was, that's what it looks like today. You can just see a little mush, but they drained it in order to put in the county buildings. Probably not critically important. But there's the there's a, just sort of a view. This one here is what I want you to look at: the children's shelter, uh, the county facilities, the probation building, and children's court. Everybody knows where that is. This is Old Willow Path. This property here was actually the home uh, of uh, Ebenezer Smith, another Smith in the Hopog area. Uh, he built a huge house there, pre-revolutionary, um, and um, that property then will be converted into the county facility that you see there now. Now it's a police center. Now it doesn't have the probation section, but that's where the, the, the uh, section is. Can't leave out a discussion of Hopog for two minutes uh, without talking about Hopog Road. Uh, Hopog Road left Hopog and went up through Smithtown. This was old Hopog Road, H-A-P-P-A-G-U-E. People had all sorts of problems with Hopog. If you ever hear a news reporter say Hopog, it's always on Aaron Valley Power. They have a, just can't do that. Uh, but there are a number of pictures showing Hopog Road. This is 1904. 
I want you to look at that. In 1954, they come up and straightened, straightened Hapag Road. They took all these wings out of it. And in doing so, you can see where it used to go. You see where you can see where the, the that's where the post office is up top, which you're leaving Hopog and you're coming up, and that road goes down and goes right across if you want to sneak into uh, Uncle Giuseppe's. <sighs> just head down. <laughs> that's what interests you guys, Uncle Giuseppe's. That's what I get a response from. So you just want to go home and eat, is really where it is. There. It's really cut the sister up, let's go eat. So ultimately on down the line, there was a, a huge oak tree. Uh, that came down in September of 1954. That was smack dab in the middle of Hopper Road. Uh, great, great picture of that tree. Loved it. Uh, this is interesting. This is the hop hog. Uh, this was built by uh, Lawrence Smith uh, in the early 1900s. It was a four-mested sloop. He built two of them, the Comac and the hop hog. Uh, this one was torpedoed um, in uh, 1918 by U-151. Uh, and... Um, the, the German commander let the uh, crew take off. Uh, he then, um, I shouldn't say torpedo, he set charges and uh, the ship turned over but didn't sink. They ended up towing the sucker back uh, to shore, putting it back, um, floating it, re, uh, refloating the little sucker. Uh, and it sailed in 1929 until the Depression took it. And now it's up the Mist River. I tried to get some money from Smith Historical Society to get me to go up the river and take pieces of the hop hog ship, but they didn't think that was a good idea. But there were two of them, the hop hog and the comac. And this one is uh, one of my favorites. Um, this is Lindbergh. Lindbergh flew over hop hog. Don't take any stories that you hear that tell you that he flew over Lake Ronkonkoma. That is absolutely not true. There is a picture that is in the, the news uh, from May of 1927 showing Lindbergh, and they say he flew over Lake Ronkonkoma. However, in going down to the Smithsonian, I got a hold of his flight plan um, and found out that he flew out Long Island. He didn't leave Roosevelt Field and head over the Atlantic. He came out Long Island, flew over Connecticut, Massachusetts, remember a circle route across Newfoundland, over past um, uh, Ireland, and then into France. So you're going to go the circle route, not straight out. So if you want to swim, to England, swim past my talk point. I got much better laugh with Aunt Uncle Giuseppe's. But anyway, when I went down to the Smithsonian and looked at their archives, sure enough, they had his plan, which comes right to Hopog, and then shows him flying over Blydenburg Lake, Blydenburg the pond. Two people verified that. There was a fellow named Embry Rockwell who saw both planes. There was the Daily News uh, chase plane. And Lindbergh, that was the last picture taken of Lindbergh in the air before he gets to Paris. In the air, he said, no, I was on Main Street on the, uh, in the village of the branch, and the plane went over. He couldn't have gone to Lake Ronkonka because if he went to Lake Ronkonka, he had to come back this way. So I know precisely, and you can find this little section. There's nothing like that looks like this at Lake Ronkonka. Okay, this one little section is the beginning part of uh, Blydenburg Lake. Uh, and so that was the last picture that the dailies took, but they didn't do their research real well and claimed it was Lake Ronkonka, but it was actually hop on. So this was the plan. Uh, this was uh, old Lee Koppelman's plan. I'll go through this very, very quickly. He did this in 1960. Hopog was the only town that accepted his plan for development. Here he has eight industrial areas that he thought would work well. He set up residential streets. Uh, he then indeed uh, did work. Uh, dealing with multiple sections, dealing with professional buildings, uh, and also ways to get into the town. He set up sections for districts, for fire districts and park districts. Uh, he had proposed parks that he wanted to see the county do. He actually had schools. Can you see them here, Fossbrook? Up top, this is before, this is early stuff, uh, but uh, he was a sort of a magical character. That is indeed uh, the industrial park, which rivals uh, Silicon Valley in California in size, uh, by the way, just so I tell you that we do, we do rank. Uh, this was his proposal to put an extension of the expressway, didn't happen, Up right smack down the middle of Hop Park. He wanted to put that in, obviously to uh, access the industrial park, which probably would have been a smart move at the time. And that's uh, Oli Koppelman who's still teaching uh, at uh, the university.
Um, I'll give a little bit of credit to a character here by the name of Simeon Wood. Simeon Wood wrote the first history of Hopog. If you get into the library here, make sure you see Krista immediately, and she will put you with a newer version uh, of this book. Uh, it came out in 1920. Uh, and that was the first history of Hopog. If we want to look for lineage and names, uh, you'll find it there. Um, this is uh, his house. Uh, this obviously rush hour. There's, there's one horse. The picture of you paying attention. Uh, yeah, and there's two deaths. Simeon Wood and his brother. Yes. I, this group is tough. We arranged uh, is this actually. Uh, so ultimately, I, and I only show this because I just want to give credit to the characters who are there. Uh, that house is still there. It's on 111. Is that your house? <laughs> it's the first time this has ever happened. And I think this is the color today. Isn't this the color today? It's great. Okay. See that? You learn, you learn, everybody introduce yourself on the way out, and then we'll all meet at her house tomorrow night at 6 30. Be a small dinner, nothing big. You have a party. So that's uh, Simeon Wood. So believe it or not, Hot Bug, the neat little place it is. Again, I give credit to um, not only Simeon Wood, but Jack Marr, who did a secondary one. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend uh, reading Jack Marr's book. Uh, there's another book that's tough to find it's Colonel Rockwell's scrapbook. Uh, it's the history of Smithtown, but he does have. Uh, houses that are related to Hopog in the book. It's the scrapbook that gives with the with, uh, other items on the line. And if you're really bored, uh, this one is the history of Smithtown, uh, which has a whole section on Hopog in it and includes most of the stuff that I talked about tonight. And since I wrote it, I'll, they should have it here at the library. Yes. I believe that that is presently now the oldest. When you start with um, Wheeler and a few others on down the line, even uh, the Cornish House and a few others are going to be after that. But there have been some extensions on that, but it's still, um, I, I usually try and covet what I say. It's one of the oldest houses in Holland, if not the oldest house. Yeah. Any questions before? Uh, they they didn't really, we didn't really run them off. I know that sounds odd. The Indians on, on Long Island died off mainly because of disease. They did not have their contact with us. The, the colds wiped them out instantaneously. Uh, and so they had a real bad problem with that. Uh, so there's a group of um, Hapagians that I have traced out to the east of Long Island who went up to Oneida County. So they left Long Island completely and just moved off. Um, and they had a different viewpoint for land sale than we can understand. Um, when we wanted to buy a piece of property, we said, uh, we'll give you X amount of money for this. We'll give you some edges and we'll give you some pots and things like that. And they said, sure. They had no concept of land ownership. And there was a piece of land sold in Manhasset. Uh, the Indian, after the white guy said, let's, we'll take this land. He said, now, White man, how much will you give me for a sunrise? How much will you offer for a fresh breeze? Because he thought the land is going to be here after all of us are gone. You can't own land. You can own food because once you consume it, that's very understandable. It's no longer usable. You can consume water. But land is here, and you're not going to own that. You can hunt on it, and they would let each other hunt on lands that were there. There were certain sections they said, this is, this is what I have to hunt on to keep my family going. And so you understood that. But you can't own a fresh breeze and you can't own a sunrise. But you can understand why they thought that. They thought it was all combined in the same element. We had a different, we had a different concept of, of ownership. Then we put fences and they said, what do you mean we can't go here? We just let you hunt. The, we thought they were selling hunting mates or just being nice. That was not the case. That's why it looks like Manhattan was sold so cheaply. Yes. No, he's got a park out on the east end of the island. He's got the Koppelman Park, uh, but uh, no buildings. He, he was a difficult character. Uh, I will tell you, when the county buildings were built, uh, he, was a, he was a tough-egged guy. I interviewed him a, a number of times and did a thing for the Long Island uh, History Council. It's on a... Uh, it's on a videotape that you can get online. Um, he, uh, he made everybody, he was a smart guy, but he made everybody seem like that they didn't know very much. 
Uh, and in the process, he irritated a number of people. In fact, some of his fights, I won't get into that here, involved moving furniture. Um, no, <laughs> but uh, when we were building the county buildings uh, all the way up top, uh, um, the, the county executive at, at that time was uh, uh, Mr. Klein. And Ms. Klein came in and he was looking at it along with the, with the fire department. And he said, gee, we have this wonderful building. It's up, you know, he said, uh, can your uh, fire equipment get up to the top floor in this building, uh, the 12th floor? And, and he said, no, we can get up to the 10th floor. Really? Okay, put me on the 10th floor and put Koppelman on the 12th. <laughs> so I, I, I love, that when you speak to people about, uh, there's a lot of funny stories that, that come out with with that one, and and that and that was just one that dealt with that. Okay, I yes, last question. Downtown Hopog, I think, is where the intersection of Town Line Road meets and one of the Hopog Road. Yeah. That if you take took a look at the early map and, and any of the books will have that, you'll see all the names are right in that one little section. Blydenburg, Bush, Smith, they're all kicking around that one little area. Yeah, no, ours is Town Line Road. We never really had a, a, a village center, except for, and when we had one, you know, we, uh, uh, we, uh, I tried to get the hop on town hall moved. It, it didn't work out when I was doing it. It just didn't happen, so. No, no, we have a wonderful little town. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Guys, have a good evening. So uh, before we finish up, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Gish for coming tonight. And um, I just want to say that part of the celebration tonight was for uh, the history of the library. Uh, we wrote uh, a history of the library that's soon to come out. And some of those helpers are right here. Nancy Picard helped us out with the writing of the history of the library. It's at the printer now. Uh, so it's very exciting for that. And uh, we're looking to have it in everyone's hands uh, shortly. So again, a round of applause for Mr. Gish. Thank you very much. I'm going to, I, I tell you, your face looked familiar. I don't know whether you came back to school or something, but you look familiar to me. Yes. Yes. Tell her I said hi.